so the penultimate speaker is Moin Qureshi. Moin is one of Yale's students. Uh, he, after he got his PhD, he went to IBM Research, and now he's an associate professor at Georgia Tech. <coughs> Thank you, Dirk. Uh, happy to be here. Uh, I was here about six, seven years ago. Um, so I'm glad to be back for Yale's, as they say, mid-career celebration. So for those of you who don't know the joke, Yale has recently won, Yale has always won a large number of awards, but one of the big deal awards when he won, he said, you know, thank you for giving me this during my mid-career. Yeah. Uh, so my talk will be about memory and there's a lot of talk about whether memories will scale, technology will scale. So I got something from a saying from the English. I didn't know whether today Scotland will be a new country or not. I just took a guess. Apparently Scotland is staying together. We'll see if uh, memories can scale or not. So one of the biggest problem with memory is that we're all taught this memory hierarchy. Right? The memory hierarchy is about capacity. It's about latency. So if you have a timeline, how many cycles does it take to access a particular structure in the memory hierarchy? We all know this L1 cache, a couple of cycles, last level cache, few tens of cycles, and memory, a few hundred cycles, and then there's a disk. This is not just a, a latency or a capacity hierarchy. This is also a technology hierarchy. If you notice, each structure is made of a different uh, technology node, SRAM, EDRAM, DRAM. Uh, hard drive is made of magnetic material. And so because of this big gap, it's natural that there are, there should be things that can build this gap. And in fact, there is a technology that we use, Flash, that has built this gap. But still, there's a huge gap between memory um, system speed and storage speed. Right? As the system scale, as we increase the processor count, as we uh, try to do more and more work, the application working set increases. And to get performance, it's important that uh, the memory system capacity must scale as well. There are a few things that are making this difficult. First, technology scaling is hard. It's always hard. But uh, it's even harder for uh, memory. For logic, roughly the trend has been you get twice as many transistors or twice as many cores every two years. But DRAM DIMM capacity doubles roughly every three years. So if we just continue on these curves, the memory capacity per core actually goes down 30% every two years. Right? But that's assuming that DRAMs can scale. The problem is that whether DRAM will scale or not, that itself is questionable because it's very hard to scale DRAM below 20 nanometer. Nobody will tell you the exact number, but it's somewhere near the high teens or the mid teens. Right? And why is DRAM scaling difficult? Uh, logic scaling is also difficult. The problem is that DRAM scaling is even more difficult than logic scaling because when you scale, what you do is you try to reduce the area. And so with scaling, you reduce the area by a factor of two. But the problem is that for maintaining the same retention time, you want the capacitance of the DRAM cell to be identical. If the area shrinks, it's a cylinder. The length has to increase. So every technology generation, you're reducing the area by a factor of two, you're increasing the length by a factor of two. And if this keeps on happening, what you get is structures that are very, very small and very long. So the problem is not just designing that 10 nanometer by 10 nanometer DRAM cell. It also has to be 1,000 times longer. Right? And such structures are mechanically unstable. Uh, they break. And this is really what, uh, what is one of the biggest problems with DRAM scaling. As you scale down, these structures uh, will break, and you'll have more errors. And so what do we do with memory scaling? Fundamentally, there are two approaches. Uh, if DRAM has problems, we can either fix those problems, right? And we can help, uh, we can find a way to scale DRAM. Or we can find this new technology and figure out what are the problems with the new technology and provide architecture solutions to solve the problems of that technology. In this talk, I will talk briefly about three things that I have worked on briefly. Um, the first is, uh, how do we help scale DRAM technology? Right? So the problem is that DRAMs have always had errors. And what we have said is, well, it's not my problem. It's not the architect's problem. 
It's the manufacturer's problem. It's your problem. If you have a weak cell, figure out how to deal with it. Give me a DIM that is error free. And that works very well if uh, your error rates are small. When your error rates go up, uh, it's problematic. It becomes too costly, and then the DRAM manufacturer might say, you know, I can't scale anymore. What are the main reasons of DRAM faults? Well, you can have break in the cell, as uh, because of what I mentioned. You can have leaky cells. You can have broken links in the DRAM array. Right? And all of these essentially cause data errors. There's a permanent faults for future DRAMs is expected to be much, much higher. And the way traditionally we have fixed it is very inefficient. What we do is we say, you know, if I have a bad bit, I'm just going to decommission the entire row or the entire column. That's something like this. So if you have a failed cell, what you do is just remove the entire row. A row is fairly big. It's a few kilobytes. Now, you might think that you know giving a few kilobytes for a bit is bad. Uh, well, if it happens once in a billion, if it happens for one out of a billion bits, it's not that much of a problem. But if it happens much more frequently, then you can't really uh, fix this with traditional modes. Right? So it might cost you more than what the technology uh, can provide you. So you might say, well, you know, fine. I will not use row sparing or a, a column sparing. I might just use an ECC DIM. Right? And the problem with this, again, is that you know, it corrects one bit per word, but if you have a large number of uh, faulty bits, then there's something called as birthday paradox. It's just a matter of time before you have two errors in the same word. And we did a little bit of analysis. Turns out that an eight gigabyte DIM can handle about 40K errors. Right? And that this is less than one part per million. So it cannot still tolerate very high error rates. Right? So what should we do, which, what should we do to support the DRAM manufacturers and tell them that it's okay if your technology is crummy. We want you to scale. We want you to give us more bits. We will figure out as architects how to make reliable systems out of those unreliable memories. So what we did is we just looked at what is a common case. Right? In the common case, if you have a, even if you have a very large number of errors, something like 100 parts per million, most of the words are actually error free. Right, so 99% of the words are error-free. Roughly about 0.7% of the words have exactly one error. And then you have a small tail. So what we suggested is rather than <coughs> trying to fix the tail bits, rather than trying to provide a uniform error correction for all of the words, why don't we just leverage the skewness and provide low-cost <coughs> error correction? Right, so something like use an ECC DIM, but figure out a way to use that ECC DIM intelligently uh, so that you don't have to pay a very high cost. And if you notice, something like SSD, it uses a very unreliable technology, flash. But we still use flash memories. Flash memories are terrible. How do we use it? We use it because there's an architecture that takes care of uh, the errors that happen it provides you a very nice interface outside, but there is, there is a high-level architecture that can take care of um, errors underneath. Right? And this is we, what we propose is something like that for DRAM. Right? So it's OK to have faulty memories, but then figure out which parts are faulty, store that information, and replicate faulty, faulty words. And we figured out um, we essentially leverage that most of the words are fault-free handle the one bit error with the existing segdead, and if you have multi-bit word, then just replicate. Right? And once you do that, once you test these memories and you can classify and you can replicate, you can deal with very high error rates, about 100 parts per million with just 1% performance loss and about 4% capacity loss. The next uh, item is how do we deal with emerging technologies? Right? So if DRAM doesn't scale, can we find something that scales? And there is a technology called phase change memory that is expected to scale below 10 nanometer. And then it's a resistive memory. You store data in the form of resistance. Zero is high resistance. One is low resistance. And 
It can store multiple bits per cell. Uh, it's non-volatile, so you can save power. Uh, right? So there are a lot of future systems, such as exascale systems, that can use PCM memory. But there's a problem. It doesn't come, it comes with its own set of baggage. The read latency is higher. The write latency is much higher. Writes are very expensive. Writes are limited. So if you just replace DRAM with PCM, you get more capacity, but you get higher read latency, higher power, higher energy consumption. And this is problematic. We don't want, we want the capacity, we want the scaling, but we don't want to pay latency, energy, or power. So how do we design such a system? I looked, we looked at this at, uh, back at IBM, and what we suggested is rather than choosing between DRAM and PCM, why not get the best of both worlds? Right? So use a little bit of DRAM and a lot of PCM. What this will do is most of your accesses will be satisfied by the DRAM buffer. Right? So the common case latency, the common case power will be dictated by DRAM. This also has an advantage that PCM has low leakage power because of non-volatility, so you don't have to pay the refresh overheads. And so this gives you a performance that's common case of DRAM, but this also gives you the higher capacity of PCM. And in the common case, if you just replace DRAM with PCM, there's a big difference between a 4X system that's made of DRAM versus a 4X system that's made of PCM. Uh, but once you have a hybrid memory system, that performance gap, gap gets bridged, right? So you can reduce the latency, you can reduce the energy, you can reduce the power with a hybrid memory approach. And the third thing is uh, something that was a part of my thesis, um, and uh, it's something that's very generalized and applicable to a lot of different systems. Systems, we design systems sort of for an average case, right? We have a replacement policy, we have a prefetching algorithm, we have a coherence mechanism, we have a memory scheduling policy, and what we do is we run a bunch of workloads and we figure out what tends to work on the average case. But for a given application or given set of applications, there's no one policy that works well for everything. Typically what happens is that application A likes policy zero, application B likes policy one, and so what you really want is a processor that's designed such that all application gets their own favorite policies. But that's, that's difficult, that's not what we do right now. What we do instead is we, we have one static policy that's designed for being good enough across the workloads. What we really would like to have is a workload uh, optimal system where each workload gets the policy that it really requires. And, um, and, and we looked at how to do this in a cost effective manner, right? So we don't want to pay cost for this, but we want the best policy for each workload. So let's say you want to select between two replacement policies, P0 and P1, for the last level cache. Right, so what you could do is dedicate a few sets to policy P0, dedicate a few sets to policy P1, and the rest of the sets, let's say 98% of the sets, they will follow the best of the two policies. How do you find the two best of the two policies? Well, just count the misses. If uh, whenever P0 gives you a miss, increment the counter. Whenever P1 set gives you a miss, decrement the counter, and then you'll, you can just check the high bit of the counter to decide which of the two policies gives you fewer, fewer misses, and you can apply that to the rest of the cache. So this will guarantee that uh, for 99% of your cache, you will have the, the best policy without actually uh, costing too much. The cost of this is about one two-byte counter. And similar approach can be applied to different parts such as uh, prefetchers, memory schedulers, coherence algorithms, uh, to give the best policy that's tuned for the workload. So a lot of people have talked about what are the challenges, uh, whether it's end of Moore's law, technology scaling, frequency scaling. What I have talked about uh, are specifically three approaches. One, rather than saying that Moore's law is ending, we can't scale, well, let's give a helping hand to the technology folks. Say that scale, if you have erroneous bits, we'll take care of it, but continue to scale. Second, um, how can we integrate newer memory technologies in our existing systems? 
right? Uh, if we just replace, then the problem is that it incurs too much latency, energy, and power. Uh, so figure out how to do that cost effectively, maybe uh, using a hybrid approach. The third thing I talked about is a workload optimized system. How do you figure out uh, to optimize your processor or your system for the given application rather than out on an average case? Now, one thing that learning from Yale, I've realized that whatever ideas I come across, there is a little bit of inspiration of Yale that I find everywhere, right? So the solution of, for all computer architecture problems inevitably somehow ties back to Yale thought. Happy 75th, y'all.